Сейчас мы предоставим слово нашему уважаемому гостю, академику, профессору Антонио Луке. Thank you very much for this uh, very honorable invitation. I am delighted of talking before this collection of young people. I have to thank in particular Professor uh, Sally Jean, uh, Professor Dr. Sally Jean for, for uh, his kind invitation. And also, of course, my good friend Igor Lobovsky for uh, having uh, mentioned my name for that invitation in reality invited me. Uh, uh, the top, the, I know that I am in a, an environment which is uh, students <clears throat> for diplomacy and energy planning, etc. <clears throat> you are not scientists, but I am sure, and I am a scientist, but still we will try to uh, get a common language, and I hope we will be able to find it, because it's very important for diplomats and also for scientists to be able to uh, uh, find a common language to understand each other. So the next slide, uh, to pass the slides, how to pass the slides? Uh, it is he somewhere here? Or? Ah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. ah, the, the, yeah, it's okay. Okay, that, now next slide. Well, I will say some few words about my university. My university, which is the Polytechnic University of Madrid, is a... a of the grouping of uh, the uh, so-called uh, higher schools for uh, engineering and schools from the, uh, uh, I mean, from two several centuries. Uh, it has, so it's the biggest university in Spain for technical affairs, and it has five sites, five, five campuses around Madrid. Uh, <clears throat> it has 15 research institutes plus 200 uh, uh, res excellence, uh, res special research groups, uh, and uh, um, uh, within this university, I was the founder of the Institute of Solar Energy a uh, long time ago. The, the, this institute is is in two campuses in the in the university. In the older one is the central building, which is in front of you, and there is another bigger building in in one of the other campuses of the university. Uh, since it was organized, the quality uh, surveillance of the, of the university, the Institute of Solar Energy has always been, I think like five years ago, has all the years been the number one, ranked number one, I think, but one year that was number two. Uh, and uh, the, the, my group, uh, is uh, my specific group of research, it is, has been ranked for the last two or three years number one out of 200 groups in the university. Uh, okay, this is the other building in the other campus. And then uh, I will say some few words about global energy. They are unnecessary, but since I have been invited, because uh, uh, Igor has uh, mentioned them so clearly and so well, but I want to say that to my perception, global energy is, uh, in reality, is the Nobel Prize for energy. You know that there is Nobel Prize for uh, physics, Nobel Prize for chemistry, Nobel Prize for uh, 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 medicine. Nobel Prize for literature is not a real Nobel Prize, it's a prize uh, organized in, in memory of Nobel, but it's not one of the foundational uh, Nobel Prizes. And uh, then there are many disciplines which are outside the Nobel Prize. And this energy is one of those, and uh, uh, global energy had the good idea of organizing it. I also want to say that uh, I um, prepared some questions for students uh, uh, organized by Global Energy several years ago when they wanted to do some contest for young students uh, that probably is not the one has been announced today but was some precedent of it. And uh, uh, I asked the stu one of the questions I asked the student was to calculate the energy in Madrid, uh, in St. Petersburg, in Hamburg, 
and it's somewhere in in a city in the north of uh, in the south of Siberia, close to the China China border, and and the the and of course the winner answered to this question perfectly, and the result is that in St. Petersburg you can collect more energy than in Hamburg. And in, uh, in this city, whose name I don't remember in this moment, which is north of China, you can collect the same energy as in Madrid. So it is false that you don't have solar energy here in Russia. Don't believe it. It is cold. The country is cool, but this is even good So for, for solar energy, at least. OK, so the, out the outline of my talk is the following. I will start with the birth and childhood of uh, photovoltaics, the need of solar power, the silicon cell technology, which is the workhorse of the solar energy, the rise and fall, uh, the cost of photovoltaics, the rise and fall of Spain's PV, how, what happened, uh, and then third generation PV, and, and I will draw some conclusions. And then if we go to the birth and, chi and childhood, I have to say that the farthest president is uh, Alexandre Edmond Becquerel, was a French scientist that very, very young, it was 23 years or something like that, he found that when you shine light on top of one uh, uh, setup, a, a rig organized there, the current was modified. He didn't know why, how, but he uh, published it into, in, uh, he communicated it to the Academy of Science of Paris. Then this was not explained until Einstein, uh, the, in, in 1905, published a very uh, interesting paper about why the light influenced the electric current. And then he got, in 1921, he got the Nobel, uh, he, he got the Nobel Prize in physics for his services to the theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photovoltaic effect. In these days, the, so it was associated with his discovery of 1905. However, in these days, he was already very interested in relativity, into the relativity, and he, his uh, talk to the Academy of Science of Sweden uh, was on relativity. But the Nobel, the prize was not granted for relativity, but for the discovery of the photoelectric the effect. Uh, the first effective solar cells were uh, prepared at Bell Labs in the United States in <coughs> 1954. And before being the, it, it uh, published, uh, I mean, New York Times published something that said, vast uh, news said, saying, vast power is tapped, tapped by battery using some ingredient. And then uh, a little bit later in July this year, the paper was the scientific paper was published in Journal of Applied Physics, and it was a paper by Chapin, Chapin, uh, Fuller, and Pearson. Chapin was uh, a physicist, uh, Fuller was a, 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 an engineer, and Pearson was a, a chemist, and they produced a solar cell with 6% efficiency that in these in this days was 50 times bigger than any precedent solar cell. And uh, 15 times, sorry. But the first uh, use of solar cells in, uh, in reality uh, that became lasting was the use of solar cells in the space. And I think it was first done in the Sputnik 2, I believe, uh, in 1957. Uh, and since then, and the, so the Russians very quickly uh, perfected the cell made at Bell Labs, at Bell Labs. At Bell Labs and uh, put it into the space. And for 20 years, especially meant for the space. Okay. Then, what is a solar cell? A solar cell? In a solar cell, you need two things. You need, on one hand, you need a, 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 a material with two energy levels, a lower energy level that in semiconductors, semiconductors are the materials with, uh, to make most of the solar cells. Not all, but most of the solar cells. So this lower energy level is the so-called valence, uh, valence uh, band, in which the valence electrons that you know are the outer electrons of any material, uh, 
uh, they lie in these levels of energy. But then they have another conduction band, which usually is almost empty of electrons, but which is situated one or two electron volts uh, above the conduction band. And then uh, mm, what you do with the solar photons is that you pump electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, and then this is one of the things you need, a material with two levels. But you need, second thing, is a selective contacts that are able to collect only the electrons which are in one of these bands. In this case, you have to have a, <coughs> a selective contact that collects the electron in the conduction band. Then these electrons which have higher energy use this energy in converting it, I mean, use this external energy in making some useful work, like, for instance, moving a, a motor or whatever, and then uh, they lose the energy and they are pumped with, they are sent again into the semiconductor through another selective contact that connects these electrons with the band of less energy into the semiconductor, which is the valence band, in the semiconductor, which is the valence band. <coughs> So this is essentially a solar cell. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy. Now I have talked about history and a little bit science. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy. Why we need solar power? Okay, some people say, well, we should decrease the consumption of uh, energy. Yes, indeed, we have to decrease it. But if we put, if we plot here the Human Development Index, which is an index that tells you how good a society, how, how well the citizens of a society live. And then you connect it, I mean, you plot in the abscissas the, the energy, the per, per capita consumption. Then you see that uh, the best human development, development index is for countries which are above 5,000 watts per capita. And countries like China or India, which are these two big countries, uh, blue dots here, bigger blue dots, which are tremendously high, big. This is China, this is India. Then you, you have a human development index, which is smaller, and you have a consumption of energy, which is smaller. This cannot be kept for long. I mean, China today is developing very fast, and uh, one day they will become... Uh, b big, I mean, their human development index will be better, but they will become a big consumer of energy. And the same thing with India, and the same thing with the countries which are in worse proportions, because uh, the, it is a law of the thermodynamics that the conditions of different bodies uh, equalized. And it is, in my opinion, it is wrong to say that the gap is being separated. It's just the opposite. Like the temperature of two bodies, hot and cold, uh, just tend to have the same temperature. The reaches of the mm, wall tend to be the same. This is because of the contact, because of the globalization. Okay, now, few obvious statements. The incorporation of two billion of inhabitants to the consumption pattern of the one billion in the developed world will require and present effort in management of resources and wastes to allow sustainability. This is quite logic. Uh, solar energy is the only sustainable source we can count on. Coal, and to a bigger extent uranium, unless accepting the plutonium cycle, oil and gas have limited duration, and all of them involve unbearable wastes. Photovoltaics is the best way of exploiting solar energy. Unlike other technologies based in 19th century science, photovoltaic relies on 21st century science. Very high efficiencies will eventually be possible, and, it is a must to exp and this is a must to exploit a low-cost resource, which is huge but diluted. Okay, when you look at energy balances, uh, in reality we are consuming today about 12.8 terawatts uh, in average, a little bit, about 15 today. But uh, this, this is the consumption of the world today, uh, in total, of the total energy. The sun is sending to the earth 89,000, almost 90,000 terawatts. So, uh, almost 10,000 times, 8,000 times more. So, uh, solar energy is enough for all our needs, absolutely, if you can convert it into useful energy with certain efficiency. If the efficiency is very low, it's 10 to the minus fourth, 
then uh, uh, you will not be able to produce the, the energy you have in our planet. But the photo, the, and for instance, biomass. Biomass is uh, so-so because the, the, cons the conversion efficiency of biomass is very low. Wind energy. Wind energy is very, um, very interesting today, but in reality, um, wind energy is only a part of the energy of the solar energy that comes to the to the earth. And because of the difference of temperature between poles and equator, then it moves. I mean, the air moves, and so a little part of the energy coming from the sun is passed to the wind. And again, the wind is the same thing. I mean, it is very interesting. The development of wind energy is tremendous today, but in reality, it cannot exceed the, 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 the needs of the humanity. However, with other renewable energies like geothermal or tidal, okay, they, are, they might be very good locally. There are places in which the geothermal energy is very important, but it's not comparable with solar energy. The only real global solution is solar energy if we are talking about renewable energies. And, but photovoltaics, as I said, is a science, of, is a technology of the 25th century. And then there are many, many, <coughs> many, many uh, uh, te different technologies. And this is a very famous chart in which uh, 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 NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratories of the United States, uh, gives uh, the top efficiencies at any moment uh, achieved by the different centers. Uh, we are here, we have the top efficiency today for uh, dual junction solar cells, and we are operating at very high concentration. I will talk about that a little bit later. But there are many technologies. The most, uh, the most used technology today is silicon technology. That is more or less, uh, more or less uh, I mean, the efficiencies stopped a long time ago because they have rich maturity. So uh, you don't have more, uh, you, you don't increase efficiencies. This is a solar plant. This is a solar power plant. This is uh, installed by the Spanish company Acciona and is in the south of Portugal. It's a 46 megawatts plant. You see here the town, the town of Moura, uh, and you see here the, uh, the aspect of the, of the solar plant. It's a huge land. But don't be so afraid. Some people say, oh, photovoltaics takes too, too, too much land. No, no, don't believe this is true. In reality, the amount of land which is used for food today is in the range of 13% of the emerged lands. So 13% of the land emerged from the sea is already used for agriculture. And then in the future, the, the top of the, emerged, uh, of the land for crops is probably 27% of the emerged lands. The efficiency from food to edible calories is very, very low, 0.03%. That is why, <coughs> that is exactly why this is so, uh, I mean, this, you need so much land for, for producing uh, food. So for today, already today, you are using much more land for producing food than for, for anything else in the world. And, and then uh, the, the efficiency, photovoltaic efficiency today is in the range of, uh, thank you, is in the range of uh, uh, 5% uh, in front of, I mean, considering the land used, uh, not considering the panel uh, itself, but the area, but considering the land and the land area. And uh, in the future, it will be something like 10%. So uh, it is important to understand that, the, mm, for instance, having one third of the world electricity at 10% of the of ground efficiency will uh, be something of 0.2% of the total emerged land, negligible with respect to the one it is used for, for, for uh, food. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit of what is the energy, uh, the, the, the workhorse of the uh, production of energy. And this is the silicon cell technology. So I am going back a little bit to science or to technology because, science, because diplomats and, uh, uh, have to be familiarized with these <laughs> terms. They need to know about everything. Well, one important thing is that silicon is the second most abundant element in the, in the earth crust. Uh, after oxygen. There are some elements which are very scarce. Uh, 
again, I remind you that you needed for making a solar cell a material with two levels of energy. And then second thing you needed to have is uh, selective contacts able to take uh, the electrons out from the higher energy and then another one for putting the electrons in at the lower energy. How to do that? Okay, you start with a semiconductor, which is uh, silicon, and then you mm, try to avoid the reflection on top of the silicon, which for that you make something like that, uh, uh, at an attack, uh, uh, an etching, which is a little bit uh, rough. And then you put a diffusion of phosphorus on the, on the outside the cell. You cut this, the front and the back. Then you put here an anti-reflective coating. Because if you don't make treatments in the silicon to, to avoid the reflection of the light, only at most 60% of, of the light will enter into the silicon. Much of it will be reflected and lost. So you have to make a, a, a treatment to permit most of the light, over 98% of the light in, in modern solar cells can enter into the silicon today with these treatments. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to put here a uh, aluminum grid in the back. This aluminum grid is the one that is going to produce the contact with the valence band. The, it has the, pro the property of making the contact to the valence band. And then you put an, on top a, a silver um, contact that makes, uh, in reality, contact not with the bulk of the material, but with the part that has been diffused with phosphorus. And this produces the contact to the conduction band. So the solar cell is made. Then, let's see, but which is the business, industrial business of photovoltaics? There is a chain of value from silica, which is the material from which the silicon is taken, the silicon dioxide, like sand, to the uh, solar cell. And then the first thing you have to have is quartzite, which is a rock form of silicon dioxide. Uh, then you put, carb you, you put coal on, on that thing. And then you, you pass a current through the system, it melts, and then you get pure, more or less pure silicon, 98% of purity. Then, next step is the purification. For purifying silicon in the 60s, it was invented by Siemens that it was easier purif to purify the silicon with, uh, with, uh, by chlorinating it, by, chlor by putting chlorine into the silicon. And then, it, uh, and, and then it forms chlorosilanes. Chlorosilanes are liquid at room temperature. Then you can um, purify them by fractional distillation. And then the super pure uh, tri trichlorosilane you get is, is lately, is finally uh, uh, reduced to silicon with hydrogen. And then once you have that at high temperature, once you have that, what you have to do is to grow crystals of very high perfection. Because any impurity in the silicon, either chemical or lack of um, organization of the atoms, will produce what is called a recombination, that is an electron in the upper uh, energy level to pass to the lower energy level and not to be able to go out and to make its work then you have to use very pure silicon. In reality, you have to use nine-ninths of purity. That means that you have an atom, a foreign atoms, every 10 to the 9, every billion, American billion of uh, silicon atoms. You have to have it very, very pure. And then once you have done it, you have to go to... Uh, make wafers. You just cut these ingots into wafers with a very long wire, uh, multi-wire uh, saw. And then you make the solar cells in the way I have explained. And then you put them into modules in the way you see here. Uh, that are uh, You put the solar cells, you connect the cells. Uh, the, in reality, each cell has about 6.6 .6 volts between the top face and the bottom face. You put many in series. 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and you put, connect back to bottom, back, uh, back to front, back to front, back to front, until you have 20 volts or something like that. And, and then uh, you put them into uh, between two, a piece of glass and a plastic, and everything embedded into plastic. And it is the same uh, technique that is used for uh, the same technique that is used for 
making anti-ballot uh, uh, glasses, uh, panels of glass, then it is very solid. It's extremely solid, a, a photovoltaic module, module. And then you go to, to you make uh, installations either in, the, in remote places, maybe developing countries to give some electricity, or in, in houses like my institute, or in, uh, or in uh, power plants in the, on the ground. Okay, the cost of PV. Here is a calculation, a recent, more or less recent calculation of the cost of PV. And then here you have the cost of the module, depending on the technology used. Those are different <coughs> technologies. Uh, you have then the cost of the power plant once it is installed. These costs are in, do, in, in euros per watt peak. If you multiply it by 1,000, you have in euros per kilowatt peak, which is more common in the business of energy. But, uh, uh, and, the, and then here, you have the, the levelized cost of the electricity. But I want to mention you something. When you see here, it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.2 cents, 20 cents of euro per kilowatt hour, which is expensive. But why is it expensive? Okay, there I am going to, tell, to say you something. If you, in reality, here I, put, I have put the rate of return of investment. But if you put the return of investment only instead of 11%, 5% that can be done with uh, uh, soft credits that are being received by developing countries and things like that, or m many soft credits, then you, it will turn out to be in the range of 13 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, if you even take into account the inflation, then this rate will be something like 3%, and then you can go below 10 euro cents per kilowatt hour. So it is, uh, and I want to tell you that because this shows that it is even more important that, than technologies is the agreements, the political actions to promote these things. To have a credit at low cost permits to have electricity at very low cost. To have uh, a political structure that allows you to, uh, I mean, pay 20 cents, as it has happened in Spain, per kilowatt hour. It produces a tremendous increases of the, of the, of the market and reduction of cost. Here, for instance, I put the, the cost of electricity in several countries, in, in a number of countries, and then you see that, uh, for instance, Italy is very high. For Italy, only, four, uh, only six, even if you have six dollars per kilowatt, uh, you will be able to, to produce uh, photovoltaic electricity at the same price the people, the retailers, the homes pay in Italy for electricity. Other countries are more, more smaller, more, much smaller, for instance, India. And even if they have, if you make, uh, have a very low price for the modules, it will be not uh, cost effective uh, in this country. Uh, and this here is also the radiation. I mean, it depends on the radiation. The, the countries with less sun, of course, require lower price to be cost effective. But the, the count, and Spain is here, it's, border, it's borderline, because in Spain the electricity is a little bit too cheap for photovoltaics. Okay, any good in general uh, experiences what is called the learning curve. The learning curve is the reduction of the price when the accumulated market has increased to a certain level. For instance, if the accumulated market is one gigawatt, then the, the the, level, the price of, elect, of the module will be about five uh, euro cents per uh, five cents per watt peak, and uh, this is the trend that photovoltaics has been had. It is a 22 percent of learning curve. It is not as high as strong as the one of the semiconductor memories, but it's not bad. But then let's see. I <coughs> published in 2000, in year 2000, a model in which I plot, uh, uh, I, 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 I did a forecast of the future of photovoltaic electricity by putting together the learning curve of photovoltaics with the sensitivity of the demand. We look at the sensitivity of the, de of the demand, which is the, lo the logarithmic derivative of the, of the annual market re with respect to the, to the price. And then you, you see that this is my, my forecast in the, in the optimist, in the realistic, I mean, this, this was what I consider in 2000, realistic, optimistic, and pessimistic. 
and uh, the result, and, and the, this was related with the amount the developed countries were able or willing to put in, in supporting photovoltaic electricity. And it turned out that it was 0.03%, the, my central curve is 0.03% of the uh, GNP, uh, the, the, their, their domestic uh, production. And then it, it is it, 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 what the reality. What has been the reality? The reality has followed very much me, my model, except that it has exceeded the most optimistic uh, uh, um, considerations I have done. And today, uh, I, it is expected that next year this um, this thing will happen, but uh, it has not happened yet. And then um, I was able to predict the price, and the price of photovoltaics today is, is very close to the one I, I mean, is within the range of the price I predicted uh, 10 years ago. And the, this is the evolution of the, glow of the installations in the world. And then uh, it is interesting to see that there are other possibilities. For instance, these two curves here, this shows what would happen if I am able suddenly to have a breakthrough that produces modules much cheaper than the present module. Then there is a vertical asymptota, which is an artifact of my model, because my model considered it was my model was done to see when the electricity will going to, was going to be at the same price of the normal electricity at the production level, because there are two prices to consider in electricity production. One is the retailer price, the price of uh, house pay for the electricity, which is higher because it has all the, all the cost of commercialization, and etc. And then uh, the, the generation price, which is the price at which the electricity is bought from the company that produces electricity, the, the owner of maybe a nuclear plant or whatever. And then those two prices are different. And I said, well, I want to get the price of the mass produ producer of electricity. But then I said also the market is infinity. And then when the, since I got the, 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 here we got the, the price of prevalent electricity, and then the market is infinity and it grows to infinity. But this is false. But it tells you when it starts to be cost, really cost effective. And then one possibility is to have this breakthrough that makes the cost much lower. But more important is to have a new technology in which the learning curve is faster, like in the semiconductor memories. And this is what we are pursuing. OK, so uh, what, I mean, how compares my model with other models? For instance, the, inter the international, uh, the intergovernmental panel of climatic change, a very important uh, the, uh, body, the Mitigation Working Group 3, uh, they foresaw a penetration of 1.4% uh, of electricity only for 2030. My central scenario, but it's not, I, I say, it's ri ridiculous. Okay, my central scenario was 1.6. My optimistic, uh, optimistic scenario was 4.4. And I think today I am sure that my optimistic scenario will be exceeded and, uh, because it has already been exceeded and it will be below, above 4.4 for 2030. Uh, in reality, on, on the other hand, the promoters of PV, for instance, California or the European Union, they say we want to have 12% by 2030. Okay, worldwide this will be very difficult. It will be uh, to be able to install 100 gigawatts, gigawatts per year. Uh, uh, but in certain areas, it will be possible. But still, I want to compare with the reality. Today, we have produced, last year, we produced in the range of 30 gigawatts. Uh, I mean, 100 gigawatts is very much, but we are already at 30 gigawatts, one-third of this amount, and the growth is exponential. And this year, we will be probably here, and we will be at 70, 80 gigawatts. So it's not, we are not that far. Okay. This year, I said, okay, there are, we need three, uh, I mean, I, I said, photovoltaic electricity will not be competitive with con conventionally generated electricity unless some of the following events happen. One of the following events happen. It is enough that one happens to get 30% of the electricity by 50-50. One happened was electricity price rise. It is undesirable. 
Commercial schemes substantially reduce marketing costs. New inventions reduce initial cost of, of or offer more cost, cost reducing potential. Okay, let's see what happens. And let's see the rise and fall of Spain's PV. What happens in Spain? In Spain, the, this is the primary, one of the prime minister offices. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, in reality, we inaugurated, uh, the day that we inaugurated in 2000, uh, a photovoltaic uh, canopy there, uh, the, the prime minister announced a royal decree for giving a high price to the electricity. It was, uh, uh, they paid 42 euro cents per kilowatt hour uh, to the producers of photovoltaic electricity. And then what happened? What happened, it was an explosion. It took some time because the utilities didn't know how to handle it. It took some years. And then uh, the, the royal decree was re reformed for, to please, I mean, to fulfill the requirements of the utilities concerning handling of the, of the grid. But what happened was an explosion. This blue is the ex Spanish market because it was too high. I mean, it was a very good business to produce electricity at this price. At, and over 1,000 companies started to produce electricity and to sell to the grid at that price. And then by the end of 2008, uh, we, uh, of, the 40, of the 50 biggest plants in the world, 40 were in Spain. And of course, the first, the second one in Germany, but the rest here are in, were in Spain. But then, and this, is, this has been the biggest plant in the world of 60 megawatts, uh, that has been the biggest until two years ago or something like that, in which the biggest one is, ta is in Canada. And then uh, uh, you see, uh, okay, most of them are ground plants. And what happened? In reality, what happened is that it was a very good business, but in addition, my, my, for my vision before of how photovoltaic was going to be developed, I put that the module was only one third of the cost of the system, because I thought that the marketing was going to be high. But then with that, the marketing was extremely reduced. And today, the module is only one half of the cost of the system. And because of that, I think this is a breakthrough that has a breakthrough in commercialization to consider that power plants are, uh, are more appropriate for making photovoltaics that the distributed model, it is often uh, Consider, and still is considered by many people, but my feeling is that, my, that what will be the winner will be the big plants. But in reality, what happens? Okay, PV is faster. Is the fa in Spain, in 2008, we installed 2.6 gigawatts. 2.6 gigawatts means, at the same, in reality, a gigawatt of photovoltaics is working less hours than a nuclear plant. So 2.6 gigawatts is equivalent, produce the same electricity as a nuclear plant of half a gigawatt. So, and this year we were discussing whether we extended the life of one nuclear plant of 1.5 uh, gigawatts or not, because the time has finished and they wanted an extension. And the curious thing is, in the same year, in one single year, the same amount of this power plant was produced with photovoltaics without nobody realizing. And the, what the problem is that, and the, the, the thing is that there is no technology in the world that can be installed, because to install a nuclear plant requires 10 years. No power energy can be installed as quickly as photovoltaics. So that I try to convince the Japanese uh, with little, I think I will not have success, but I try to convince the Japanese they have lost three or four gigawatts in their country because of the uh, accident. And, and uh, if they want to recover it, the fastest way is to put by photovoltaics and they would become a very powerful power, uh, allow me to say that, in the world in photovoltaic industry. They are still, they are already very good but they will be much better, much better. For instance, in Spain, well, in Spain, but the, the, the authorities became afraid because they didn't expect to be forced to pay as high, so, such a high price for photovoltaics. And then they rapidly, by the end of 2008, they stopped the, the production. And then uh, uh, they, well, not they stopped, they put rules that make very much more difficult to continue. I mean, we still are producing half a, a gigawatt every year, uh, uh, installing. But then, but in Spain, probably the Spanish grid can allow only, about, because you have to produce the electricity between the base and the peak, because you need to have a reserve, a capacity reserve. And then 
that in Spain probably allows only for about 10 to 15 gigawatts. So the problem is that in one year we made one fourth of our capacity in reality. Uh, this is now the generation in Spain. Spain is probably the country with biggest intermittent, I mean, biggest renewable penetration in the world, at, at the least of the big countries. And then uh, you see here, uh, uh, this is water, I mean hydro, this is wind, which is very, this is nuclear, this is uh, uh, solar in 2010, today is 4, 4%, and this is biomass. And then if you look at that, it is 40% of the, of the whole production of electricity in Spain, which is based on renewable sources. Uh, and many of, many, much of it is uh, intermittent, like the wind, the solar, all that is intermittent. Then, uh, but at the same time, we make all that, but we build a very powerful industry in Spain of photovoltaics. These are the industrial companies that were created for uh, an amount of about 1 billion euro to produce elements for photovoltaics all over the country, you see? There are more, I mean, these are only those which are associated with one of the associations, the biggest one, but there are three or four more which are not associated uh, with this association. Then electricity price rise, okay, if we were able to convince uh, uh, to sell, I mean to convince what is called the net metering, that we sell the electricity at the same, at the, at the, we sell the electricity of power plants, of photovoltaic power plants at the same price the retailer pays, then at big, uh, this is unfair because we are not having, I mean, we are not paying for the distribution, but if we convince uh, the government to do that, it will be maybe the price, the electricity rise of price, the price the rise of electricity price that will be necessary. But then we have found a breakthrough in commercialization with the big plants. And because of that, I think this condition has already been fulfilled. So I am very confident that, we, that uh, by 5050, we will have about one third of the electricity in the world based on photovoltaics. And then, okay, science. Uh, what about science? Okay, we conveyed in 2002, we conveyed a meeting in Cercedilla in a beautiful residence of, the, of, the, of my university in a forest in the mountains north of Madrid. And then we invited about 30 specialists and uh, among them um, uh, the Nobel laureate Alfiorov and we published, we prepared a book with their ideas that is called Next Generation Photovoltaics, uh, High Efficiency Through Full Spectrum Utilization and we tried to see why the learning curve of photovoltaic was slow. And we found out that it is slow because, all, because the efficiency is limited. You cannot go to very high efficiency with classical photovoltaics. Why? Because only because of the photons of the solar spectrum, the, red, the infrared photons are not, collect, not converted. They don't have enough energy to produce the pumping from the valence band to the conduction band. The other photons that have enough energy and not too, too, too much energy, they are well converted. But the photons of very high energy, they lose, the only energy you can recover is at most the, the band gap, this, this distance. And, this, this, and, and they, those are not very well converted. So we said, why to, how, to do, how to solve that problem? Well, the easiest one that was known before is to have stacks of solar cells that are of different materials, so every cell has uh, converts properly a certain material. And the photons go through, the, the photons which are not absorbed in this material goes through the stack and is, are absorbed in the other and then in the other, and then the efficiency can be very high in reality. But these cells are very difficult. So you have to use, constant, are very expensive. So you have to cast a lot of energy in the cell to be cost effective, but you can do it but for that, you have to operate at very high concentration. <coughs> and here is our institute's uh, record cell with two junctions, only two, not three, uh, uh, that goes up to 5,000 suns. And we have done that in cooperation also with Joffe Institute. And then we are here, but the top efficiency is here. And you see how fast these efficiencies are growing, and this technology is becoming more and more mature. This, and then we, uh, we, I convinced the Spanish authorities 
to uh, organize uh, an institute for promoting photovoltaic concentrators. And then we uh, offer a call for, we made an all for tenders. It, was, it costed 25 million euro and we devote 18 million euro to make a call for tenders in which we ask companies from all over the world to come to Spain and to be, we, we paid them provided they had a pilot line. We didn't pay them little uh, amount. We paid, at least you have to have 300 kilowatts uh, to install. And in reality, several companies came to install. Eight companies were granted, and eight out of 14 that we received uh, proposals, uh, eight companies were granted, of which uh, here you see three. This is Spanish, this is German, this is American. Three companies were granted inst with uh, about uh, uh, 0.8 uh, kilowatts each one. And uh, now they are providing data, they are giving data of this new technology for uh, all over the world, and it is helping very much uh, to the development of this new type of technology. Also, in this respect, uh, the biggest plant, uh, the, big, the country with more photovoltaic concentrator, triple junction photovoltaic concentrators, is, in, is Spain. Out of 20 megawatts in the world, Spain has about 15, and the biggest plant is this one, which is a plant of eight gigawatts somewhere in Spain. In, 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 okay, somewhere in Spain. Then I think this technology can, could be the breakthrough, technological breakthrough which we are looking for and, and forward. And Joffe Institute here is very advanced also in that technology. And then today we have been funded for another for, for developing more this technology in cooperation with Japan. We have got I am principal investigator of a Spanish. Japanese project in which these are the Spanish country, the Spanish centers, the European centers, no, sorry, European Japanese. And these are the European centers that are involved here. The group leaders are, I mean, the mm, task leaders are my institute and the Fraunhofer Institute in, in, in Germany. And these are the Japanese centers and the task, the task leaders are those centers here, University of Tokyo, Sharp, etc., Dido Steel. And then we think that uh, this might be considered the break, scientific breakthrough which is necessary. So, uh, but going further, we, want, we invented uh, uh, a new, new thing to make these triple junction cells to be in a single cell. And then it is, uh, they, Americans publish, uh, after Cercedilla, for instance, they publish a book, more ambitious, but a book of the technologies, the new technologies, and they said revolutionary photovoltaic devices, 15% efficient solar cells. And they identified three technologies, among which the one we have invented in 97. And this technology is very, uh, I mean, many people are, is working today in this technology in, in the world and uh, in the United States, in, in the East, in Europe, in the Middle East. Uh, and, uh, okay, what, what is happening? It looks we are duplicated, or maybe it's a mistake. Okay, and then I go to the conclusions, and the conclusions are that solar energy is the only sustainable option for an explosive extension of the Western consumption pattern. PV is already a reality, about 60 gigawatts are already installed in the world. One and possibly three conditions are met already for achieving price parity with the wholesale prevalent electricity in the first mid of this century. Bigger plants are being installed that reduce drastically commercial costs. Maybe net metering will be acceptable for large plants. Retail electricity costs will be achieved in several countries, but this is not ultimately cost effective by itself and can only be temporary. The thin film, well, okay, the thin film, I, have, I haven't talked about thin film. I took it out uh, for the sake of, the brief, of brevity. But so I, I, I don't, well, I say the conclusion. We'll eventually, uh, might eventually be able to produce the wholesale price of electricity, but there are problems of material availability. Uh, the, the materials they use are scarce materials and maybe environmental, environmental ones. Very high efficiency, over 40%, have been achieved, and novel high efficiency concepts are being researched. They, uh, they have a fast learning curve potential. Novel concepts towards very high efficiency are being investigated. Photovoltaic will 
most likely become a major producer of electricity before the mid of the century. Thank you for your attention. У меня два вопроса. Безусловно, энергетическая корзина любого государства должна зависеть от специфики государства, наличия ветров, там, солнечного, климатического пояса. Это все понятно. Там, запасов традиционных там, угля, нефти, газа, политики страны. Это все понятно. И важно, безусловно, очень важна ваша работа. У меня вопросы состоят в следующем. Себестоимость вот этой одной ячейки, которая состоит из кремния, титана, алюминия, серебра, пластика, герметика, тонкопленочные технологии, это, безусловно, понятно, я думаю, и всем сидящим здесь в зале, что долгосрочные последствия, вы не рассказали, Антонио, об экологии, насколько вот выработка вот этих панелей, она... В общем, в процессе любой стадии производства загрязняет охрану окружающей среды. Это первый момент. И второй. Сколько вот это энергии требуется на одну ячейку и стоит ли игра свеч, чтобы правительственные деньги, там, леготирование на это. Вот у меня вопросы в этом состоят. Окей. Okay. Yes. Uh, the, to the first part, I mean, the first part of, the, of your question is very logic. I mean, it's true that every country has its own conditions, uh, even uh, insulation conditions and uh, availability of uh, other alternatives. But it is interesting to understand that Germany, that has very poor uh, climatic conditions, is uh, the leading market in the world for photovoltaics. And the reason they do it is because they want to, I think, is because they want to be the leading industrial uh, country in producing solar cells. With respect to the second question, it's a very interesting question. The, the, going back to the last uh, part of the question, how much energy will they produce? This has been deeply studied. And uh, for silicon technology, uh, depending on where you put uh, the cells, uh, the time for producing the electricity, the, the, the energy they have consumed in its production is in the range of four, four years maximum. I mean, depending uh, the place, of course, but four years maximum. And there are other technologies that can permit to, to balance the energy used uh, in one year. Uh, the... the, the um, so uh, the duration of a solar cell is there is no a limit to it. I mean, it, there is nothing that degrades the solar cell by itself. But it's common to consider that after, after 25 years, it is, it is uh, uh, amortized. So in principle, uh, you ca could say, OK, four years and 25 years, although, as I said, there is not a limit. If you ask me what is, the, what is the price of a module, today the price of the modules are below one, uh, one, one um, dollar per kilowatt per watt peak, or if you want to say in more common terms, 1,000, not, not sorry, the euros, less, it's below 1,000 euros per kilowatt peak uh, today. And uh, concerning the, the danger uh, con associated with solar cells, I think the uh, silicon technology is extremely safe. Uh, the most uh, consumed product is silicon. Silicon is very stable, uh, but at the end, the only thing we'll produce is silicon dioxide, which is, uh, after many millions of years, it will, it will become silicon dioxide because oxygen is the most abundant uh, thing on the, um, element on the Earth and will come to the, begi to the beginning when it was and, uh, silicon dioxide. And the conversion, of course, is, a, is the only 
process in which there is a specific production of CO2, the production of, of, uh, of uh, the silicon, I mean, the reduction of silicon from silicon dioxide to, to, uh, for, to silicon, it pro this produces CO2. Uh, but it is negligible as compared with the production of CO2 uh, in, a, uh, fuel, in any fuel technology. Okay, I think I have respond, answer to uh, your former questions, but probably you want to ask some more things. <laughs> Ну, вопросов на самом деле много, я только один себе позволю, потому что у ребят больше. Повышение КПД с 10 до 50 процентов, считали ли вы, насколько изменятся климатические особенности региона, в котором будут стоять очень мощные вот эти элементы? The main uh, modification of the climate by, by um, energy production is the CO2. The CO2 is a, a serious danger. But the other, the other problem could be, I mean, the problem you are probably referring to is the change of the reflectivity of the Earth, of the albedo of the Earth. If you cover the whole Earth with, with solar cells, of course, then it will uh, uh, increase the absorption of, of heat by the Earth and the temperature will rise. But because of the high efficiency of the solar cells, amounts of uh, 0 0.0, I said, 0, uh, I don't remember what, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 uh, of the emerged, land, emerged lands is, uh, is uh, in reality, uh, ne necessary for producing 30% of the electricity in the world, for instance. In this respect, you modify it, do, you modify the albedo of the Earth only in 0.01% or something like that of the former albedo with a real big penetration. So this aspect is negligible. <laughs> Спасибо вам большое за интересный доклад. Вот в начале вашего доклада вы сказали, что Россия холодная страна, но это не означает то, что нельзя получить солнечную энергию. И в связи с этим у меня вопрос. Как вы оцениваете будущие солнечной энергетики России и учитывая то, что у нас количество солнечных дней невелико, по крайней мере, в Москве, и намного меньше, чем, например, в вашей стране. Спасибо. Окей. Okay. Concerning my first uh, statement about the temperature, sometimes the developed countries are very proud because uh, they find out that the, the efficiency of using solar cells in these countries is better than in developing countries that are but very hot. But this is not because the developed countries are more effective than developing countries. I, maybe they are, but uh, it's not the main reason of this difference. The main reason is that the solar cells decrease their efficiency by, with the temperature. So the best place to have solar cells is in a place which is very cold. So the coldest the, the, the place is, the highest deficiency of the solar cells. So it, this is what I was referring to, that if you have a sunny day with very low temperature, it's perfect. It's the, the dream of any solar cell uh, manufacturer. Then the, the, my, the question of how, lo, how far, I mean, the question of how much solar energy you have in Russia, you have a lot, you have a lot. You, I mean, you, if you look at, this, uh, at the southern part of Siberia, uh, you have as much as Spain. It's more or less similar to Spain. And you have much more area than Spain in the, south of Siber in the southern part of Siberia. If you look at the northern part of uh, Russia, 
uh, for instance, in St. Petersburg, uh, you have, you have, uh, you know, the worst part is the medium latitudes. But in the pole, you have very powerful anti anti cyclones, and then you have a lot of sun in the close to the pole. I mean, half of the year, the other half of the year is night. But during the half of the year, which is day, you have a lot of energy. So it is uh, the, the in the fig in the. In the statistics, it doesn't appear because, in reality, the light comes very inclined towards the surface. But if you put, for instance, systems tracking the sun, you have to put them far away because they, they cast very long shadows. But if they put them far away, then you can get a very high energy. I, I, the calculations is that St. Petersburg has more energy, I mean, can get from photovoltaics more energy than Hamburg, for instance. And uh, well, uh, and about the future of Russia uh, the, in solar, it depends on you. I mean, it depends on, on if you convince your authorities, your academia, you are, uh, that this is uh, a very good option. Uh, you have the science for doing it. You have the sun for doing it. You have the capital for doing it because you are very rich in oil, uh, in, well, in particular in gas, but in other prime matters. And you might uh, use part of this in promoting uh, the development of photovoltaics. And there is nothing wrong in putting the scheme of feeding tariffs. I mean, you are of the countries that might permit yourself to put high feeding tariffs that would be automatic for developing the industry, for developing, I mean, the simplest thing can be done is to put feeding tariffs, as we put in Spain, uh, that we paid 40 cents of kilowatt hour uh, of, uh, of euro per kilowatt hour. If you put, for instance, today a feeding tariff of 25 cents of euro per kilowatt hour, I assure you that you will create photovoltaic industry, powerful photovoltaic industry, and you will do it very well, and you could say, okay, a part of the of the um, of the elect, of the revenues of the country that we are using from oil, uh, we put it into that. That is more expensive than conventional technology, but has a very long-lasting future. If you convince your authorities, your academia of that, your future is bright. Will you be able to convince them? That I don't know. <laughs> In your opinion, when will solar energy be really competitive with traditional energy? Thank you. Can you wave? I don't see who is the, yeah, the person. Ah, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so say the question again, please. Uh, in your opinion, when um, will solar energy be really competitive with uh, traditional energy? Well, I think uh, if I am right in my talk, I think it will happen. Uh, mm, depends. You okay? I think very short. I think it will happen before twenty before twenty fifty. I don't know which year. Probably after twenty thirty and before twenty fifty. But I cannot go. I cannot be more precise. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Здравствуйте. Большое спасибо за интересную лекцию. У меня два уточнения. Первое уточнение касается дота размера дотации, о котором вы говорили. Датируется установленная мощность или фактическая выработка электроэнергии в Испании? The feeding tariff is precisely, I, I am against the, to be paid by the installed capacity. I think the, the, the big secret of the feeding tariff is that you pay for the liver electricity. So you cannot cheat. I mean, you just, uh, you cannot cheat. While, while if you are paid for installed capacity, the possibilities of cheating are immense. Mm -hmm. И второе уточнение, опять же, касается дотации, как они изменились, ну, вслед, изменились ли они вследствие экономического кризиса, ну, то есть за последние три года. 
по всей Европе, не только по Испании, если можно. Okay, I think I think the feed-in tariff uh, is so effective that uh, has to be. I mean, the secret of the feed-in tariff is that it has to decrease with the time, even if there is no crisis. Crisis. Why? Because in reality, when people talk about prices, prices to whom? Prices to prices to. I mean, the the feed-in tariff fixes the market price, but and then the companies. They reduce their cost as much as they can, but they never tell anyone about which their, their costs are, because it's the base of, uh, uh, of capitalism. I mean, you try to, to earn as much money as you can, and then you, you do research for decreasing your cost, but you don't tell that you are decreasing your cost. So it's very difficult to know which is the real cost of electricity. You only know the market price. So the feed-in tariff, uh, and for sure, the companies are reducing their, their costs. So the feed-in tariff has to decline because the, the government has to understand that the, co the cost is being reduced, and uh, it is the meaning of the feed-in tariff, the, the, the price to be, I mean, the cost to be reduced, and because of that, the price to be reduced. And then the, the, the perfect organization of a feed-in tariff is reducing continuously the cost to force the companies to produce cheaper and cheaper. Well, once this is said, how it is, uh, how the crisis is affecting. Okay, in Spain, what happened, I think is part of the, the crisis, but in Spain, what happened is the government became frightened because the growth of the, of the, of the, of this market was tremendous. And I think this will happen in Italy. Mm, I mean, it is, um, the consensus is that uh, feeding tariffs will be almost terminated by um, 10 12 in European Union. By 10 12, I mean next year, they will be finished. And then it might happen that the grid parity is established, and insert, that means that you are permitted to sell at the same price you, the, the electricity is sold to um, uh, homes, to houses, to, to retailers. If this is done, the, the, I mean, I think today in Italy it can be afforded by photovoltaics. And other countries, and Germany, and Germany so so. And, and then uh, we will see another explosion based on, on these uh, new rules and the decrease of costs. Uh, I think in countries like, like Russia, for the purpose of uh, creating your own thing. Uh, so, but now, so the, but I finish with the, your question. I think uh, the crisis is not affecting primarily uh, the feeding tariffs, I should say. всех наших гостей, Антонио Луке, я хотел поблагодарить вас за интересную, очень содержательную лекцию и, конечно, пожелать вам дальнейших успехов. Спасибо. Спасибо большое.